Hi, it's Jen here popping in before this video starts. This video is insanely long because I get on my little high horse and I can't stop talking about books. I'm going to apologize in advance. But if you stick around through the whole video, you get to hear my opinions on some books. You get to see me change my mind on some books and actually rate them lower than I originally did. You get to see me get really mad about a book. You also get to see some fun editing stuff and you get to see Jude Law from the holiday. So if that's not worth your time, I don't know what it is. Enjoy the video. <laughs> Hello everybody, my name is Jenna, but you guys can call me Jen. Welcome back to my channel or welcome if you're new. Hi, hello. Welcome to my March wrap up. We're gonna be talking about the 13 books that I read in March. I got my trusty bullet journal here to help me out in the stack of books sitting next to me. So we're just gonna get into it. I ended up reading 3,836 pages across the month and also listened to 38 and three quarter hours of audiobooks, which is a lot less than usual because a lot of these books that I read in March were not on audiobook, which is rare for me, as you guys know, literally have my earphone in my ear. I always forget about that. If you ever see that little black shape in any of my videos, and that is my earphone that I have forgotten is living in my ear. <laughs> read seven fantasy books, two graphic novels, two literary fiction books, and two sci-fis. Without further ado, we're just gonna get into it. And I apologize for any weird shadows or the light that's gonna flash across my face. My window is open, it is bright and beautiful outside, but unfortunately, because as a glasses wearer, that's all you're gonna see. <laughs> Oh dear. Started off with an absolute banger and my favorite of the month, The Shadow of What Was Lost by James Islington or Islington, however you say his last name. I ate this up. Five stars. Amazing. Iconic. It is a just about 700 page fantasy tome. I read this in two days. Literally read 500 plus pages of it in a day because I could not put this down. It is fabulous. I am starting to find, and I'm like having this genuine feeling that I think James Islington, I looked back for the other book, is currently underneath you as a tripod. Love that. Starting to think that James Islington is becoming a very favorite author or like it could be a favorite auto buy author for me because of the way that he crafts stories. There is something about this. And I think I mentioned it even in my like favorite authors video that I did last month. I just, there is something about the way that he crafts his stories. I don't know what it is. He's phenomenal at it. And I've read only his two firsts of his two trilogies, this one and then The Will of the Many. The Will of the Many was four and a half stars and this was a full five star for me because this felt exactly how I want high fantasy, the old man fantasy, if you will, that like little genre, subgenre term that people are using. This feels like what I wanted that exact fantasy genre to mean. <laughs> I, oh, this was everything. So this follows a group of kids, a group of young people, if you will. We have Davy we have Wur and we have Asha. And at the beginning of this, Davian and Wur and Asha are all going to a school to kind of hone in on some like magical powers that they have. And in this world, people of their ilk with magic are looked down upon. There are tenants in place that are literally like magically law abiding laws that are tattooed onto people's skin to keep them in line. They cannot use magic, the, their powers, there's a name for it that I can't remember at the moment, against someone without these powers in a harmful way. They literally cannot, it is not possible. They can try, but the spell or like whatever magic they try to do is dissipated before anything happens. Like nothing will happen to that person. And then they'll be found out and you know, <laughs> incarcerated or turned into a shadow which is something where these people get like a device clocked to them and it drains them of this power, of this magic that they have and leaves them with a very physical marker around their eyes. It's kind of like, in my head at least, it's what <laughs> the, the vampires from the Vampire Diaries look like in the show when they start getting their like, <laughs> the black like veins around their eyes. In my head, that's what the shadow people have on their face. I could be entirely wrong, but it's described as like black veins coming out of their eyes. It's a very physical marker. They are then demoted to like the lowest possible level of society because society sucks. Anyways, so it follows Avian mainly. He's our main character. He's our... Well, guy, he's such a sweetie. I love Davian so much. Davian, at the beginning of this, is really, really worried because there's a big test coming up and he cannot get himself to perform magic. He used to be able to. 
he cannot anymore. Something is stopping him. But he also has a different ability that he's not told any authority about, just as two friends, Asha and Wer. It's this ability that is connected with these mythical level beings who were all murdered in a recent war, the augurs. And so he is an augur. He has the powers of an augur. He can tell when people are lying. And that is only one of the many different powers that an augur can have, for example. But that is like what we're set up with. So school, Davian, we're Asha. Davian's got some weird powers. He's terrified about a test coming up. The night before the exam, he's approached by a teacher or a like examiner who's come in from outside, not part of their school, come in from the outside. And is like, hey, you need to run. You need to go. You need to follow where this tells you. He gives him like an artifact that like glows if he's going in the right direction or whatever, like a magical compass, if you will. <laughs> and he's like, you need to go find somebody who will help you with this because you know you are going to fail those th these exams and you are going to be turned into a shadow. And because of your powers, you cannot be turned into a shadow because we need you as an auger to help protect boundary because something is trying to break through the boundary the boundary is something in his world that i believe is protecting between the realms and like keeping this big evil at bay basic fantasy stuff you know and so davian decides you know what yeah i'm gonna be turned into a shadow if i stay because i know i cannot do this i cannot win or i cannot pass these tests no matter what and so he goes to leave and then his friend were comes up in the middle of the night. And he's like, hey man, what's up? Why, where are you going? And so Davian tells him all this stuff. And then Ware's like, well, I'm coming with you. I'm not letting you go alone. And so these two boys like <laughs> leave in the middle of the night. Luck would have it that they leave that night because the next morning we wake up in Asha's point of view after the boys have left and started their journey. Asha wakes up to the entire school massacred in their sleep. She wakes up. She's the only survivor. Goes from there and then it just keeps spiraling and spiraling and spiraling out. And this world deals with the coolest magic systems. So not only do we have like the regular magic system with like the people who are, God, what can, they're called the gifted. They have the four tenants, like keeping them in line kind of a thing. The gifted are these magic people. They have reserves of magic in them that they can use to do things, you know? And it's a very physical magic system. It's like, you can see the light, you can see the magic that they're working with, that kind of a thing. And then you have the augers and the augers can do all such cool stuff. Like not only can Davian see lies physically manifesting out of people's mouths in the form of smoke but like he also thus he, he meets people other augurs who have these powers who have different skills and they can see into the future and then they have visions and stuff some of them can go invisible some of them can manipulate time and that's a big thing in here because time is a very big taught like theme in this so on this like adventure davian and we're come across this kid named kaden this person named kaden who does not know who he is and does not know why he's imprisoned and doesn't know if he was really the reason why an entire village was slaughtered where he came from <laughs> covered in blood he doesn't know. So Caden is a new person in this. And then there's also like a guy who has ties to Davian who like saved Davian's life when he was a little kid, when he was being beat up by a bunch of adults in the street for being magical, you know? And so that guy, he's like a mentor kind of person. And there's a lot of quest, quest vibes in this. And there's moments where we slip into time. And there's moments where characters get to see older characters from the future who have come to like relay messages back into... There's such cool stuff. So what I find with this book is that James Islington has crafted such a perfect introduction to this world and this story and these characters. It is some of the most masterful work I have seen as a first in a trilogy. I have been talking about this for so long, but I just need to tell you how much I love this book, okay? It is phenomenal. And I had a lot of fun trying to wrap my head around time being used in this because I, as someone, I don't know if I like time travel as an element in books. I don't like memory loss in books. And the fact that this has both and I really enjoyed it, I don't know, man, James Islington is doing the best, but yeah, a perfect introduction to his world and is like slowly sinking us in while still giving us all of these big things that are like setting this tone and everything for the future. I really enjoy this. You could not tell by the fact that I've been talking about it for forever, but this is 
book number one and this was my only five star of the month loved started this started march with this so everything from here is kind of downhill i'm kidding i did have a fairly okay reading month but yeah this bad boy five stars next up i ended up reading eldest i and this is a reread for my series series video that i'm doing for the entire inheritance cycle by christopher paulini as you guys may remember from my last wrap up where i read aragon in that month i also ended up reading brissinger later this month as well so we have these two books to talk about i really enjoyed this reread for eldest i think it was very solid for someone who went into this reread only remembering like two percent of the book i had a great time okay it was like reading it for the first time i remembered very little about this book from when i had read it a couple years ago so coming back to it was a good time. I really did enjoy this. I liked where Christopher Paolini was taking the story from Aragon specifically and kind of ramping up what the character Aragon is learning and also deciding to implement the Carvajal and the Varden storylines as well because then not only do we have a bigger picture on like what's happening in this world, we're not just honed in on just Aragon and Elismira where he goes in this book, but it's opened up so that we're seeing what's happening happening back in Carvajal where Aragon started and also at the Varden where he was for the end of Aragon and also the beginning of this which also gives us a very nice action plotline with those two because the Aragon plotline in this is just him and Elis Mira learning that is it right like it's him learning it's him trying to get over a disability that he now has because of something that happened at the end of Aragon it's all this kind of stuff right so it's a very slow storyline with his air with the like 80 percent of the book but then we have the through lines of the Carvajal and the Varden uh, storylines that just amp things up a little bit and keep you interested and keep you going and I think that was very well done and I think there is definitely a step up from the Aragon writing to this writing I definitely had a good time I mean I rated them about the same they're both four stars there is that but yes this was definitely a really good continuation and then of course the third book in the series Brissinger I enjoyed this not as much as the previous two I ended up giving this three and a half stars I think there are some issues with pacing in this and right at the beginning I felt like we were reading a different character I like the more that I think about it the more I'm like no there's something that's sticky with the beginning of this book for me I don't know what it is it picks up four days after the end of Eldest and the choices that Aragon is going through and what he's choosing to do felt arbitrary and like Christopher's like moving his little fingers into the plot and it didn't feel like something that Aragon would choose but then later in the book like it's Aragon trying to justify his choices because everyone else is like why did you do this what he chose to do at the beginning of the book and I'm also there like bro why did you choose to do this and it also felt like Christopher was just putting that in the book to get rid of a couple of villainous characters just so that they would be out of the way and that Christopher wouldn't have to write that anymore like it felt too easy of a fix for those characters that had been plaguing Aragon and his cousin Roran for two books and that they were dealt with in the first 50 pages of this and there were choices by Aragon in the beginning of this it just didn't make sense to me for his character even though he tried to justify it for the rest of the book to everyone else and it like it kind of made sense with the justification but it just it didn't feel right it didn't feel like it fit and this book felt too long and too aimless because it just didn't have like a central through line plot until like halfway through the book so with the first book Aragon you have the quest you know it's set up that Aragon finds this dragon egg and then he witnesses his farm and his uncle be destroyed and then he sets off on a revenge quest to find these two creatures the Razak who did this to him and uh it, it, that's like the whole thing he goes on the quest with the storyteller Brahm. That is book one. This one, the point is the learning, is him learning how to be a proper dragon rider, getting all the education that he should have had if he was raised as a dragon rider. And then also seeing the fallout of Aragorn's choices in Carvajal and then also the Varden preparing for war. This is a war book. Nothing happens. <laughs> For the first like half besides all these weird choices that Aragon makes at the beginning it feels like a lot of just like sitting around and waiting which I guess is 
what war is, it's just a lot of sitting around and waiting. Like they're not actively trying to find out anything. The Aragon's not actively learning about anything. There's a couple interesting storylines that are very character based, but they're not moving forward anywhere. So it took me a while to get into it. And then I finally just like forced myself through the rest of it because I was like, I need to just get this done. But the last half of the book was definitely good. I enjoyed the whole Brissinger part of it. I enjoyed seeing a little bit of the other rider that was introduced in Eldest and how that was coming in. But I also think it was very repetitive with the attacks from the other rider and the other army, even though the stakes were raised with the other army coming in because of the modifications that Galbatorix is doing to that army, right? But the repetition of the other rider coming in and then Aragon being defeated, but then the other rider being like, I'm out. <laughs> leaving leaving everyone to think that Aragon kind of won happens a few times in a way that makes me wish that one of those times had gone differently just because it just felt so repetitive and I think that's because it's a war book war books are repetitive because what are you doing you're at war and what is war battles you know lots and lots of the same it, it was it was okay for me I'm also intrigued to see in book number four which is the last book of the series how everything wraps up how all the choices that were made in here kind of spin out into the last book you know like what is Christopher doing what is he setting up but yeah three and a half stars so we did a four star and a three and a half star with these two I didn't read them like right back to back but I figured because I read them both this month I talk about them at the same time after reading Eldest I ended up reading a library book I read a lot of library books this month I read You Exist Too Much by Zaina Arafat this is a Palestinian Arab American book about a Arab American woman who is queer and she's dealing with that and also having a love addiction. This book really was not for me. I was, I don't know, when I read literary fiction books, I need them to just do something for me. There's, I don't know what it is. There's a specific kind of literary fiction that I will read and usually does really well for me, like Penance, for example, by Eliza Clark, or Against the Loveless World by Susan Abahawa, or Enter Ghost by Isabella Hamad. Like those recent literary fiction reads actually worked for me and I really enjoyed the stories and I enjoyed the way they were they, they were written and that kind of stuff. The You Exist Too Much didn't really work for me. I think it was probably the content and the characters that just didn't really work for me. I listened to this three and a half hour audiobook. It was a lot longer than that, but I listened to audiobooks at a ridiculous speed. We know this. I listened to this over three and a half hours when I was doing errands one weekend. I gave it three stars. It just really wasn't for me. So it was an examination of love addiction and queerness and otherness and also like how some people can be so destructive to themselves and to others through these problems that they may have like love addiction. Uh, so it follows our main character who I don't remember the name of as she has like really toxic relationships with people in her life who are actually in relationships with her very unhealthy relationships and then in these relationships where she finds as soon as she gets like comfortable in the relationship she starts looking for love elsewhere she works as a DJ so she like has random hookups in the bathrooms she, like she's becomes immediately obsessed with people and desires that like flame of connection and she gets scared and it's this like she desires this feeling of obsession and, and love and connection and stuff like that and she has like really and she chases a lot of people that she cannot have a married friend who's pregnant a like a old professor who conversations with her exclusively through email and the occasional coffee shop visit like she pines over these people and thus it ruins her relationship that she has with this woman and in this she like kind of <laughs> comes realizes that there's probably something wrong with her and she ends up going to this like retreat kind of a thing for various addictions part of the book is her there meeting the people there and she's so mean to everybody she's so like above everybody she like considers herself like so much better than everyone else she looks down upon others she condescends to others She's just one of the worst characters that I've ever read from as a POV. Then like it's the also the after of like more relationships that she might have with people and like different connections and how she like ruins those works as well. And then how other people are also garbage. Then it like kind of ends. I don't, I, yeah, it just didn't really work for me. But if you're at all interested in literary fiction and books that examine different kind of addictions and doesn't necessarily have any likable characters, like I didn't like a single character in this book, Pick it up, you might like it. Then I read the bottom of my stack here, Lord of the Wilds by Annalise Brana. And this 
is a fantasy romance sort of cozy not really book that was originally supposed to be self-published but ended up being picked up by an agent right before it was supposed to be self-published and then picked up by a publisher after that and was published by Harper Voyager and has one of the most gorgeous covers <laughs> and is holographic. We love it. This was enjoyable. I read this in like one day and I ended up rating it four stars originally but like upon thinking about it the more more distance I get from this book, the less I like it. So it's probably like a three, three and a half star now, but it's fine. We'll just keep it as a four star. This was this was good. This follows Lore, um, who is part of a human village that is trapped all the way around and like kept in their little village by the Fae who exist outside of that village. And the Fae like terrorize the humans and whatever, blah, blah, blah. And her village is like undergoing a lot of natural disasters that are destroying a lot of things. Like there was an earthquake that just wrecked everything. And she's like, oh my God, I gotta take care of all these kids that I have to deal with because she was brought into an orphanage when she was very young. And now she essentially like helps run the orphanage and takes care of the kids. And so she's got this big like family of kids and whatever. And I feel like we just didn't get enough time <laughs> to really I don't know. It feels very now that I'm now that I'm like thinking about like the world building in this world and stuff like that. It feels very like bubble world building. Like, oh, we were in this little bubble of a town that doesn't actually feel real. It feels like just stage dressing. And then, oh, we're in a little bubble of like a palace with a library, and that's it. And then we're in a in a forest. <laughs> so, Lore gets asked by a bunch of people, prince essentially of the Fae from the neighboring Fae kingdom to come with them and be this glorified like librarian worker data keeper for them because apparently no Fae can go into this magically cursed library and they haven't been able to for millennia or whatever and so they need a human to go in to find these books that the prince is looking for. So she does that and then she, through that, she meets a guard who is the only nice person to her because every other fae person is just, like, around her is just like, no, ew, humans, ah. But this one fae guy is like actually kind of nice. And it's just, it's an interesting push and pull with that. And then she ends up getting him in trouble and they have to flee after she finds one of these magic books, accidentally like bonds with it and gets magic from it. And then they run off and then they find more fae who are like fine with her and then like 70% of the way through the book, we have the second love interest, because of course the guard is the first love interest. 70% of the way we have a second love interest introduced. I don't know. I think, yeah, this is definitely like a three or three and a half star. I'm gonna have to change my rating because it's just, the more that I talk about it, the more that I think about this book, the less it holds up, the less I like it. I think it's just because I read it in one sitting, had a great time reading it. It was, it was entertaining, let me tell you. And the ending, I have never felt so betrayed. <laughs> I will probably be picking up the sequel because I need to know what happens. But like, I won't be clamoring for it immediately, you know? It's fine. But yeah, I think it was paced weird, plotted a little funky, and like didn't have enough substance in a lot of places. And there was a lot of wishy-washiness on Lore as a character because she felt so, I don't know, like when I was reading it, I'm like, oh, I really like Lore. Like she's very like gung-ho. But the more I think about it, I'm just like, was she though? She was kind of like making a lot of shit for everybody to deal with, but everybody really liked Lore and never got mad at her for anything that she did, even though she lost this man his job and she did a whole bunch of other shit that was bad. And everyone's just like, no, we love Lore. <laughs> like, she's fine. So there's a lot of little things like that that kind of bothered me. I think I watched Kayla's from Books and Lala's review on this book. She like really did not like this book at all. So I think she gave it one star. But she brought up a lot of really, really prescient points that made me think about this book a little bit differently, which were like some of the ways that like it was set up in the writing about how it just kept being like, oh, I hope this doesn't happen because then this will happen. And then that happens. And then they're like, oh, nards, this happened because of this. And now this is going to happen. These are the consequences. So it was very like spoon feeding you exactly how things were going to be set up and then taken down in the next couple pages. So it was a little bit interesting like that. I think like the sentences were very pretty, but it was very surface level. So yeah, this is probably more of a three-star book than a four. I need to change my rating, but that kind of happens sometimes. But yeah, it wasn't bad. I do recommend it if you're looking for something like this. Then I picked up Emily Wilde's Map of the Other Lands, which is book two in the Emily Wilde's series. I really liked this. This one really worked for me. 
So I read the first book over Christmas during like a little cozy readathon at the lake and something about that book just didn't quite hit for me. I felt kind of like detached from it and whatever and I recognized it was a good book. I might have been my mood. I probably need to reread it because how much I enjoyed the second book, I probably will enjoy the first book upon reread. And it is the trope that I love. It's the scholar who's going around having adventures, researching the stuff that she's a scholar for, having adventures of magic. Like that just is one of my favorite tropes because I loved The Natural History of Dragons by Marie Brennan, which is that exact same setup. Like it is fun and so cozy and sweet. And this one is Emily writing a journal the whole time. Like she's journaling her findings and her whatever is happening and whatever. And I really enjoy the characters in this book. Like the map of the other lands is just genuinely so lovely for the like story elements that were brought in really really worked for me i also really enjoyed the addition of the two characters emily's niece and then her like superior boss co-worker man that kind of come on this journey with her and wendell as they go to play in austria i think i could be wrong it was some it was some it was somewhere <laughs> somewhere where they had to go they're cambridge scholars and they were going on a little research trip because they got a tip essentially of where they're trying to find something for wendell having these two other characters brought in really just had a fun dynamic for me. I loved the way that Emily as a character like bounced off of other people because she is so type A. So I want to say she's neurodivergent in some capacity because homegirl thinks different, you know? And I just think the way that she is so pragmatic and so just the way that she looks at the world is such a fascinating point of view to have. And then every once in a while in both, I think in the fairy one, and also this one, the way that Wendell's POV sneaks in near the end, having his voice in there is so fun as well because he's just such a charming, loving, wonderful person. And having him, his voice be like juxtaposed with Emily's and how in love with Emily he is. I just, I don't know. I had a really great time with this. I've seen so many people say that this is worse than the first book. I loved it even more than the first book. So I don't know what everyone else is talking about. This really worked for me. Next up, I ended up starting my reads for the Trans Rights Readathon, which was this month from March 22nd to the 29th. First up, I read The Scourge of Stars by Ness Brown. This is a really claustrophobic, like the movie Alien inspired horror on a spaceship that is crumbling, trying to make it back home to Earth, is probably not gonna make it. And oh my God, there's something in the walls of this spaceship killing people. I had a great time with this. It's, it wasn't big, it was a novella. It was little, it was, it packed a punch, it was tense, I could not put it down, and I had a great time with it. I ended up giving it three and a half stars. There were a few things in here that were included that just didn't need to be included, like the robot sexual assault thing. Didn't need that, did not need it at all. It added nothing to the story because there just wasn't enough time to actually like lay out the effects of that storyline and like really come to terms with it. It just felt like it was unnecessary and also that the characters around like didn't handle it very well and it wasn't handled very well with the text. You know, it just kind of left me feeling icky about it. But otherwise, it was a good time. I think as someone who doesn't consume that kind of media very often, I don't consume horror books very often, especially this like very specific claustrophobic stuck on a spaceship kind of horror. This was a really great time and reading this made me realize I have a love for this specific trope. Whether that be in watching people play through video games, is it deep space or dark space or something like that? The video game, Mass Effect as well. Like I've seen people play through these video games where it's like the horror level of like aliens have breached the ship and it's just survival at this point. That level of horror is fantastic. And I think also it reminded me very viscerally of the Critical Role one shot run by Ashley Johnson. That was like the ship one, the space one with mother. It reminded me very viscerally of that in a really good way. So I think this kind of really tiny bite-sized piece of media works for this particular kind of horror. And like, it's not surprising in any way because you know what's going on. Oh my God, there's something in the walls. What could it be? Uh, aliens, what else could it be? <laughs> like, of course, you know? So it's like, you don't, you're not really surprised, but like the way that it was written was very tense and just, I enjoy it a lot. I've never really seen a movie like that because I am not a horror movie watcher and I've never really been a sci-fi movie watcher either. So I think because I'm so distanced from this genre, I really enjoyed it, but I saw a lot of people on Goodreads like complaining that it was just a ripoff from Alien. So maybe it was just for, for people who don't usually frequent that genre, 
to enjoy it, but I really enjoy I, I enjoyed it. It was three and a half stars. It was fine. Then I ended up reading How Followed With Us by Andrew Joseph White, which was also a really great time. I went into this being a little bit skeptical because you guys know I'm not a big reader of YA fantasy or YA sci-fi or anything. I just don't like YA books anymore a whole lot. They have to be really exceptional to hit it out of the water for me. And this one, I didn't hate. I ended up giving four stars. I think it was exceptionally well done, exceptionally well crafted, and I will be recommending it over and over and over again because it just does something that I think a lot of YA books like don't do for me. Didn't shy away from any of the teeth and anger and brutality that it needed for this kind of narrative. So this follows Benji, who is a trans boy, part of a cult. The cult specifically that a couple years prior was the reason for the annihilation of nine billion people. So he's trying to get out. There's a lot of transphobia, misgendering, all that kind of stuff, dead naming in this book, right? So beware of that. In the attempt to escape, he ends up being like saved from a, like a re-kidnapping of bringing back Benji to the cult by an LGBTQ plus bundle of kids from the ALC center from the city nearby. And uh, Benji ends up getting part of this, becoming part of like a little found family. So of course the queer kids are just wonderful and amazing. It was just so much warmer than the depiction of the religious cult, of course. And so it deals with a lot of like <laughs> religious trauma, I guess the word is. And as someone who is not religious at all and does not have religious trauma from growing up, I, went into this a little skeptical because anytime something has a lot of religion in it, I get really annoyed. Not, I should rephrase that, anytime anything has a lot of Christianity in it or Catholicism in it, I get really annoyed because it's just so much. It is like just being shoved down your throat. And I think it's also because the people who are super devout in real life uh, in that specific religion, shove it down everybody's throats and it's like but chill you don't need to shove your faith down my throat thank you i don't want your faith it's yours you know so whenever i read a book with a lot of christianity in it it really rubs me the wrong way and i get really annoyed it doesn't i don't feel the same way with other religions so maybe i do have like a gentle sprinkling of religious trauma just because of that but like yeah <laughs> i felt like i need to clarify that it's not all religions it's just catholics and catholicism and christianity it's just that okay <laughs> anyways but this one really worked for me because it was a lot of like reframing, restructuring one's mind and then also coming into contact with all these queer kids who have different belief systems as well that don't match up with these and some of them that do believe in the same God that these cult people do, but like in a different way. And I think it was a really interesting restructuring of Benji's own beliefs, having grown up in the cult. That whole situation is also supported and blanketed by the fact that Benji has been infected with something that's gonna make him into a seraph, which is this monster angel savior person, right? And everyone is like, everyone from the cult is like, oh my God, the seraph, our savior, you know? And then Benji's like, I'm going to be ripping people apart if I'm not careful because that's what this is going to do. It's going to turn me into an absolute monster. So there's a lot of really interesting, like really gory, really like biblically accurate angel stuff in here. I really enjoyed it. It did not shy away from gore. It did not shy away from the brutality of it. And I think it really handled the anger of coming at something with religious trauma properly. I think Andrew Joseph White really, really did this story well. And I think that everybody who's been loving on it, the hype is so valid for this because it is such a fantastically done book. It tackles such incredible conversations. There's so many different identities involved. There's neurodivergency. There's like specifically autism with one of the love, with all of the, the people in, in the LGBT ALC center. And then there's also the different religious views. And then there's the different pronoun uses and there's neo pronoun. It's Phenomenal, phenomenal. I really enjoyed this book. I think it was fantastic, four stars. There, I read The Death of Vivigoji and this shattered me into pieces. I saw someone do a TikTok recently where it was like, books that made me weep and this was number one in my head. This one and The Book Thief, weep, you know? They just made me into Jude Law from the holiday. I'm, I'm a, a major, major weeper. weeper, you know? <laughs> that, I, this book was so good. I end up giving this one only four stars though, because I do have a couple complaints about it. But overall, I absolutely loved the way that this was framed and the way that we got Vivek as a story, as a person and as like all the characters around Vivek and their like machinations around this one event, which is the death of Vivek Oji. So in the beginning of this, we are introduced right away to the fact that the day 
Vivek Oji died was the day the market burned, you know? That's literally the opening line. They burned down the market the day that Vivek Oji died. And so from there, we get a very like back and forth non-linear view of Vivek's life. Every chapter is kind of narrated by a different person. We kind of go back to the same characters that are like the more prominent characters in Vivek's life. And also every once in a while we get Vivek as well from like a future standpoint. It was a fascinating read how the story was laid out to us, how we got to know every one of the characters in the lead up to Vivek's death and then also the aftermath. And the aftermath was what really got me. It just broke me into pieces. Like the way that this book treats a family and friends like realizing how little they know about a person. God, it was just, it was a lot. <laughs> the way that the, there's a bit in here about the mom and the dad that just, it shattered me into pieces. I was scream sobbing from that and it was just, oh, this book was a lot mentally and I didn't really read anything after this that <laughs> for a little while because I just, it was emotionally destroying. But I do wish that we had gotten to know Vivek more. I feel like we really didn't get to see who they were and because we got a lot of what other people thought and perceived of Vivek from the outside and how much they wanted to keep Vivek in a bubble. We just didn't get to see Vivek enough for my opinion and I also didn't connect with this book very well at the beginning. It took me about halfway to really sink into this book and to like enjoy it because from for the first half I was just kind of coasting I wasn't really connecting with any of the characters or any of the story like I just didn't really care until about halfway and then I was like okay no I care oh my god Vivek <laughs> like being shattered by this book so yeah four stars highly recommend if you're looking for something that'll make you scream cry and that makes you really really think about how much we really know people in our lives and how much we need to treat people with kindness and just the level of hatred against the queer community that is ingrained in a lot of families and a lot of cultures and I don't know it just made me really think and I couldn't get over this book for a while so um, am I even over it now I don't know after that I ended up picking up so let them burn by Camilla Cole I read this in the week of the trans rights readathon after <laughs> the death of Vivek Oji because I just I, it came in on my Libby I got the audiobook and I was like, I'm gonna try it. I just need something that's like a little different <laughs> and a little lighter. It's a dragon book. I wanted something action packed and easy to read. It's a YA dragon book, you know. I wanted that cleanse <laughs> of a palette before I continued on with any of the other trans books on my TBR. I really didn't like this. It really didn't work for me. And I hate that because <laughs> it's so beautiful. It's a cover by, and I made the decision. I had originally got this out from the library. I had asked my library to buy this, requested them to buy it, and they did. And I was, it was on hold or whatever, and I didn't know when it was coming in. And then I was at the store last month, I was at the, at the bookstore and I was like, it's just so pretty. I kinda wanna just add it to my shelves. Like, it's just a stunning cover. I'm obsessed with the, it's, just, it's so pretty. <laughs> and I was like, I'm gonna add it to my shelves. I have faith that I will like this. And I really didn't. It was a mess of a book. Five years ago, Farron, our main character here, was gifted the power of the gods when she was about 12, 13 years old. And these power of the gods won the war against the dragon riding enemies of theirs. So she won the war along with like a couple other 12 year old kids. Chosen one style, you know? And this is now five years after the fact where there's peace or whatever. Farron is the worst, okay? D terrible. I don't know what this month was with terrible characters. Like, I hated reading from Farron's point of view. She was awful, grating, terrible. I hated reading from her point of view, oh my God. Lies up, down. She doesn't really care about anyone but herself kind of a thing, even though she seems to care about her sister. Like, does she really even? It's kind of a selfish caring about her sister. Like, she doesn't want her sister to be doing this thing that ends up happening to her sister. And I'm just like, are you doing this because you just don't want your sister to be better than you? Is that why you're doing this? I, mm. Anyways, so this book also has been marketed wrong in my opinion, and it has the wrong kind of tagline on the front because this book, I went into this book expecting quest, dragon stole my sister, and I need to fight tooth and nail until I get my sister back. All right, so I'm thinking going into this, sisters in dramatic peril, has been stolen by dragons and that this is going to be something intense and questy that this main character is going to go on and she's going to burn down the world to get her sister back. No, this is not what we got, okay? So it says, a dragon took her sister, she'll set the world on fire to bring her back. No, 
That's not what happens, okay? What happens is Farron's sister and her are at this like peace dinner summit thing because the queen invited them. Farron's sister, Alara, is also the other point of view in here, this dual POV. Alara is trying to become part of this army, which I have a question about this army because I don't understand what was happening. They had what was what were called drakes. And from my POV here, my opinion, I thought these drakes were dragons. I thought they were dragons that they used in the army that were like sentient things. I think they're ro like after reading this, I think they're robots, but they have nothing to do with anything in the story except for basically being like telling, telling Alara that she's not good enough for this. And because of that, Alara's like, well, fine, I didn't want it anyways. Like it just, it didn't make sense why that was included. Like if you're going to include mechanical robotic dragon look like things make that more of the plot that sounds so cool give me the mechas give me these dragon mechas i want to know what that is it had nothing to do with anything it was just there mentioned like once i don't know why anyways <laughs> so that has nothing to do with the peace summit anyways these two are at the peace summit at this peace summit is another like is the other side some people from the other side there's this person, I don't remember their name. I keep calling them Sigrid in my brain. I could be so wrong, okay? Someone from the Langlish Empire with the dragons, they're dragon riders, is there. And Alara keeps hearing this voice in her head. And so she decides to follow the voice. Because of course, ends up coming face to face with the dragon. And the dragon is like, I have been searching everywhere for you. You are my wind whatever the fuck. One of the one of one of my two riders, because every dragon's supposed to have two riders. I don't know. She gets bonded to this dragon because the dragon chooses her. And because of this, all of the government officials then are like, oh, we gotta send you to that school in the Langlish Empire with your first rider, the Sigrid person, that I don't actually think that's her name, so that you can train and become this because that's like what is needed or whatever, because if you don't, it might cause war. And so she goes. So she wasn't stolen by a dragon. She wasn't taken by a dragon. A dragon did not take her sister, okay? No. <laughs> the government was like, hmm, let's think this over. You need to go and learn how to be a dragon rider. And so also that like the, the whole hook of this story happened so late in the story. It happened like a hundred pages in. And I'm like, I'm sorry. I was expecting this to be like action packed. I was very wrong. So from that point, uh, Farron, our main character here with the God powers is like, okay, I will do anything to get you back. I will do anything to break this bond between you and the dragon so that I can get you back. And Alara is off in the Langlish Empire learning how to be a dragon rider. And uh, Farron is back home with one guy who's also from the Langlish Empire but like was one of the guys who helped her win the war against his father, who's like a commander, I don't know. Hello friends. As I'm editing this part, I also feel the need to clarify that the fact that 12 year olds won a war, so unbelievable because the 12 year olds who are now 16, 17 years old are so incompetent. They're so dumb. How did they win a war that was like on its last legs about to be lost. How did they win a war? Did they stumble into it? Because that's what it feels like. It's a mess. It's plotted so terribly. I just, I don't even, it's one of those books that I don't even know how you would make better because it just, like what was the, like the, the military part of this as well falls exact, like it makes zero sense. Like it falls into the, as I was explaining with the Drake stuff, it falls into like the YA trope of like, here's a military, do I know how it works? No, of like badly world built YA books. You know, there's always a few that just don't know what war is <laughs> and how to like properly put war in books. Anyways, I need to clarify that. How did the 12 year olds win the war when they, those same people five years later are so incompetent and dumb? I don't understand. Reeve, who likes researching and likes the library, Farron really does not. But this whole book, like 75% of this book is Farron being bored in a library. That's not burning the world down. That's boring. And she's so bored that she starts playing with the power that like the gods are like, bitch, don't do this. Don't contact this person. What are you doing? There's other ways around this. And then she's like, but I'm bored. And so she like starts talking to this, other god enemy thing. 
starts dallying with those powers that are like not good. Even though she has the power of the gods on her side, I don't understand. And the most interesting part of this would have been the dragon training. Cause you know, a girl is a dragon. Love, dragons are my favorite magical creatures, okay? I will read all of the dragon books because I love them so much. I'm, I, I have written part of a draft, like my soul project as an author, is a dragon focused book like i will one day have dragon books in the world i promise it skipped over so when i was reading this and i was like wait how are we already seeing alara riding a dragon like she's known how to do it her whole life did i miss something i went back and read we skipped over a month of her dragon training we didn't get a single lick of it all we got was her being angsty with like a potential rival that doesn't actually become anything in her school and then ends up doing like a aerial fight with this dr with this other person to like put him in his place. And like, it was so dumb. It was paced so stupid and it was boring. I ended up giving it two stars, two and a half stars, but like really, is it even a two and a half star? I might have to change the rating on this one as well because it just really did not work for me. It was not a good book. It was not paced right. It was not plotted right. And the world building was slim to none. Again, like it felt like, like Lord of the Wilds, it felt like we were in bubbles. Like it felt like it was a bubble of just Farron and Reeve in a library and no one else existed except for this queen who like occasionally would like come into the picture and be like, hello, and then leave. Like it didn't have life to it. And it, it was, it's, it's marketed as this like amazing Jamaican story with like different elements of that. And like the only cultural like warmth in this story is mentioned in like a casual mention of patois being used like there's no brilliance in this world building it doesn't feel real it feels like you're in a little bubble of nothing and then in a little bubble of a school where we don't even get to see her learning about the dragon <laughs> i'm sorry <laughs> this is the longest wrap-up of life because I keep just ranting about books. That was not a good book. It's probably a one and a half star, but I rated it two and a half stars. So there you go. Take that <laughs> with a grain of salt. Oh my God. Oh my God, I missed so many books. How did I miss that many books? Did I just skip over them? Did I just miss? I missed, okay. I also read Confetti Realms by Nadia Shamas at some point this month. It was a little graphic novel. It was not for me. It's for the teens. I gave it three stars. <laughs> It's for the teens. I don't have anything else to say about that one. Then I read Nimona, another graphic novel. This one was also for the Transverse Readathon. I ended up extending my Transverse Readathon into the next weekend because I just didn't read anything during the week and I wanted to actually read more books for said readathon, you know? So I ended up picking up Nimona by Indy Stevenson. My library has a copy with Indy Stevenson's dead name on it, so I will just cover that up with my finger. This is a very old copy of Nimona. This is a graphic novel that follows Nimona, who is a little weird, fiery human being who decides one day to go and talk to the local villain and become a sidekick. That's really it. Like this story did nothing for me, but I had a good time reading it because I got the audiobook for this graphic novel. Yeah, there's an audiobook for it through my library. And it was like a two hour dramatized thing that I listened to in an hour. And it made the experience of the story so fun. <laughs> it was so cool. Like they added narration to it. They added description. They added some like dialogue to like better set the scene as though you were looking at the pictures in here. And I actually think that the audiobook was better, a better story than this was. And because of that, my experience with the audiobook, I got three and a half stars. But I think if I had just read this physically, it would have been two and a half stars because it just didn't do anything for me. It didn't blow me away in any way. Like there wasn't anything interesting with the story. It wasn't really anything interesting with gender either. Like from my, my experience with watching like the ads for the movie, it seemed a little bit more interesting and a little bit more queer, but this just really didn't come off that way. It kind of just was this little high octane mini episodic fantasy thing where we see Nimona just get, get more chaotic. And that's about it. So anyways, there's this. What else did I read that I missed? I think the only, <laughs> I feel so frazzled right now. Okay, the last one. <laughs> Oh, the last book that I read in the month of March was A Big Ship at the Edge of the Universe by Alex White. This was also the last book that I read for the Trans Arts Readathon. Not the last trans book that I'm reading because I then read this book, which I will tell you about in my April wrap up in a month. The first book in April, which was part of that TBR, but is just like the, the readathon is over. I can't extend it any further and still consider it part of the readathon. I'm just reading these books now. This one I finished the last day of March and also the day of trans visibility. So I was like, it works, it fits. This 
was really quite good. I really enjoyed this. I gave it four stars. I had a lot of fun with this. It's a sci-fi and it is a fantasy sci-fi. So it's a sci-fi with magic <laughs> and like the, the most genuinely clear sci-fi fantasy that I have ever come across because it has magic. Like a lot of the sci-fi fantasy that I have read, it just like, it feels like fantasy because it's set in a world, but it's sci-fi because it's like futuristic, you know? And, or it has the tech elements in it. This genuinely felt like sci-fi fantasy because it, it was set on a spaceship and they were traveling the cosmos, but there's magic too. So, you know, fun. Anyways, we have a cast of characters in here. We follow two POVs. We follow Nyla and Boots. Nyla is a race car driver thing. She has this magic ability. It's this really interesting racer type situation where she can like connects with the body of her car. She's like a mechanic engineer type of, that's her brand of magic in here. And she can like really just live in the body of her car as she's racing and she's an incredible racer. It's super amazing. At the beginning of this, she witnesses one of her co-racers get brutally murdered by some being that bypasses all of their security, all of their defense mechanisms and just shows up and just murders this guy. He calls her mother. Weird, spooky, kind of hag like wraith looking woman who can do some really intense magic that Nyla is like, what is happening? Nyla flees and ends up like, getting caught up in some shit and tries to call the authorities for help. And the authorities show up, but they aren't there to help her. They are there to capture her. And like, there's something going on with the authorities. Like things are, shit's bad. Shit is bad. She didn't realize how bad it was. And now she's starting to realize how bad it is. Anyways, other POV, Boots. Boots is a washed up treasure hunter who is trying to stay away from her old crew and her old ship that you, she used to be on as a like fighter pilot type situation. Like she used to do, like it's like a smuggling type of ship and she used to be like the pilot to ride alongside the ship and like defend it as like a an extra ship. I don't know, there's a there's a name for it. I, I keep wanting to say wing rider, but I think that's just because I was th I'm thinking of so let it burn, <laughs> so let them burn. I think that's what terminology I'm thinking of. But Boots in here ends up choosing to do some things at the beginning that ends up getting her rope together with Nyla and then the two of them end up getting kidnapped by the crew on the, oh, what's the ship called? Oh no, the Capricious and the crew on the Capricious who is Boots's old crew. Um, they end up picking them up and um, they kind of get wrapped up in this whole hunt type of thing to track down this like legendary warship that like holds the secret and like whoever finds it's gonna like hold the power kind of thing. That's basically what it is. It is high octane, so much fun, so much action. I can see this becoming like a movie kind of action. I really enjoyed this. I ended up giving it four stars. I'm done talking. I talked way too much and way too long, my friends. I'm so sorry. If you made it to the end of this video, please leave me a little emoji down below just to be like, yeah, I made it. <laughs> Give me your opinions on the books that I read. If you have any similar opinions on the books that you read, um, also tell me what you read. I would love to know. But yeah, I read 13 books this month. It was an interesting reading month. We started with a five star and ended with a four star. We had a couple that I'm definitely gonna go back in and change the ratings for because now that I've like sat on them and thought about them and talked them through, they are not the ratings that I gave them. They are lower. So <laughs> anyways, friends, I will catch you in another month very soon. Stay kind and keep on reading.